the human being is designed uh, to be a unity of body and soul. And unless we can put those bodily goods in perspective uh, of the goods of the soul, uh, we, we are not going to achieve the balance that we need to live happily and healthily uh, within a society that truly um, serves the common good and that also uh, uh, respects the, the dignity and freedom of the, of the individual human person. Welcome back, everyone. We are very happy to be joined again by Professor Farrow. Uh, if, you've, if you've been watching, uh, you already know we had two discussions with him already on uh, around the topic of COVID. And uh, we had to make it into a trinity. So here he is again. Um, I, I, every time, uh, I, I mean, we've been trying to focus our, our conversations around articles and he released a, a new article that seemed to follow very naturally from the previous ones that we discussed. So I thought it would be great if we could uh, invite him for another chat and he very graciously accepted. Um, so thank you for joining us, Professor. Hope you're doing I'm well. I'm very happy to see you again and to have this conversation. Excellent. So I am going to give a very quick recap on our first two discussions and try to tie them together try to paint a picture of, um, yeah, after our about three hours of discussion, what we have established somehow. Um, so <clears throat> the, the first two uh, episodes, I guess the first one you could say, uh, we were discussing the question of whether uh, an individual has a moral obligation to be vaccinated against COVID, uh, especially with the mRNA technology that was involved uh, in there. And then the, the following uh, discussion was then, is there, what are the moral grounds for enforcing a, a potential obligation if, if it exists, right? So we talked about vaccine passports and mandates and, and things like that. Um, and the overall issues that touch both topics were that uh, at the end of the day, the nature of the crisis uh, in terms of how dangerous the, the virus actually is uh, and the safety of the vaccines or how extensively they've been testing don't provide sufficient support for the measures that we observed, which include lockdowns, masks, uh, mandatory vaccinations, uh, quarantining everyone, things like that. Um, and they, they especially are, are difficult to accept when they're affecting people who don't need uh, the protection that that's being somewhat, so to say, offered like children being vaccinated or healthy people being isolated. Um, these are overreactions, I guess some could say to say it crudely. Um, and so I think with all of that in mind, there was logical ground and that's a, a logical and rigorous ground which Professor Farrow very carefully laid out um, to reject a lot of what's going on. Um, so, <clears throat> then we tried to think about what could explain this phenomenon that was so widespread that all of this coercion and fear was taking over. Um, and I think that's, that's still kind of up in the air for me, but definitely we identified uh, some degree of incompetence, some degree of fear on the part of politicians and leaders, um, and some, some degree of uh, opportunism maybe from powerful interests uh, with specific agendas to exploit the situation for profit, whether it be uh, through implementing uh, software systems that track people or uh, having vaccines be bought by governments and then forced to be given by people to, uh, to, to citizens and things like that. So there's definitely many factors that are at play here that could be shaping this, this whole state that we're living in. And, uh, you know, that all of that sort of uh, can be put together in, in a very clear framework, which was mainly Professor Farrow's contribution. Is that a fair, uh, anything to add here, guys? Okay. Seems good to I, me. Yeah, all right. Thank you. So uh, I also wanted to start with a question, uh, not specifically about this new article, which we will get to. I really hope we get to it, although we do have a tendency to not end up where we're, where we're headed. Um, 
but uh, I, I wanted to just have a general quick 20 minute, 15 minute discussion about, again, this question of how do we explain what we're seeing? Like, it, to me, it's not, it can't just be that certain people are uh, controlling the media to their advantage or, uh, you know, uh, pursuing their own selfish aims and imposing it on people. But uh, there is some sort of ideological phenomenon here that uh, after two years of this now, to me, is clear has to be a necessary component of this. Um, you know, maybe if you have a month of crazy governance, maybe you can say it's incompetence or maybe there's malevolence, but at a certain point, you need uh, individuals to be on board in, in some kind of ideology. And um, the after thinking a lot about it, I, I'd love to know your thoughts, because I think maybe it could tie into some form of theological uh, argument, and that's exactly where you live on the interface of theology and, and policy, um, where perhaps there's a religion of science that, that's coming up. Maybe um, we've rejected the spiritual uh, domain to a degree, and, and we've lost a kind of unifying story that, that we would, you know, orig originally maybe take the form of Christianity or at least Christian values that would guide our actions and you know through possibly lot it, the very reason that drives it maybe breaks it down and says well maybe there's not enough evidence to show that we should be following christianity or why the christian why the christian values and not the buddhist values so there's some sort of fragmentation that people end up using as a reason to reject these ideas and you know like the, the sort of the god is dead thing is, is happening and uh we need something to replace it so why not replace it with the most objective, uh, concrete, evidence-based ideology, uh, if you want to call it that, possible, and that would be science. And, you know, science at least is good at addressing things like uh, preserving the body's uh, health and the environment and things like that. These are concrete things that we can use to measure, and that could be sort of our uniting concept. And obviously, it's somehow deficient. I would say it's not uh, enough to really drive society, but to me, that kind of possession of, of the empirical mindset is maybe what could be behind this. So any thoughts on that would be really interesting. Well, um, perhaps we can, we can make a link between our previous discussions and this one uh, just at that, at that point. One of the things that we talked about, as I recollect, was, was the importance in in Christianity, and I, I think I probably referred especially to Augustine, uh, to order the goods of the body to the goods of the soul, and the goods of the soul to the, the, the good who is the creator himself. And when um, a people, or an individual for that matter, uh, stop being confident that there is a hierarchy of goods, they they do tend to focus more narrowly on a particular uh, good or set of goods that is visible to them, tangible to them, um, and that that can certainly be um, something as base and and um, and. Uh, even sometimes debauched as as focusing on physical pleasures to the exclusion of all else. I mean, one thinks of 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 uh, the father of the Karamazov brothers, <laughs> uh, for example, in in Dostoevsky's uh, uh, famous book. Um, but it can also be some ideal uh, economic or or as you say, scientific or more specifically medical, which tries to uh, prop up the goods of the body for as long as possible. Um, and, um, and so uh, Giorgio Agamben, for example, uh, wrote, wrote an essay at the beginning of this, of this crisis back, I think it was March of 2020 already, uh, sometime early 2020, called Medicine as Religion, um, where where he did posit something uh, of the sort that you've just spoken of. One thing that has become clear since then, however, is that if 
if we are if we are substituting medicine for traditional religion, uh, we are certainly doing so in a way that brings back some of the the worst kinds of superstitions which sometimes attach to to religion. Um, of course, historically in the in the Roman Empire, there was a distinction between between approved religions and unapproved religions, and and the one is religio, and the other is superstitio. Uh, but but the traffic between the two is pretty heavy um, when it comes to ideas and habits, and um, so that's just a distinction between politically approved religions and politically disapproved religions, really. But um, Christianity made a, a, an important and, and, and really very successful attempt to, um, to stress the unity of faith and reason and to, and to um, combat practices that were merely superstitious. And it was in that context that medicine itself emerged eventually as a more developed and more um, if you like, progressive kind of scientific approach to health. There were lots of factors there, but, but, but the, the worldview of Christianity was an important one. If we got to the point where we're trying to substitute medicine for religion, all I can say is that we've also arrived at a point where medicine itself is fraught with superstition. Uh, I, I was in a session uh, with a number of, of medical and, and political luminaries um, a couple of evenings ago in which a, a, a quite thorough account was given of the way in which the current medications were, um, were approved, the way they were tested, the way they were approved, and the way they've been applied. And uh, the, the, the details of this are really um, quite disconcerting. Um, I can't say I was surprised, but, um, but there, is, there is a great deal of fraud going on here, not to put too fine a point on it. And there is a great deal of appeal to, to talismans and, and, and political means of, of propping that up, such as the incessant use of masking, you know, even, even in, in open spaces and things that we, we already discussed before uh, and probably don't need to, to revisit. But, um, you know, when I get circulars from the university, um, uh, as recently with Omicron, you know, saying, well, we'll have to tighten this, we'll have to tighten that. And I'm thinking, I just said, no, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not frightened of Omicron. And, uh, and I'm certainly not going to go back to some of those uh, restrictions which you wanted to impose in the early days for which, uh, you know, one could justify, as you indicated, perhaps with a bit of, of appeal to panic as an excuse, uh, but, but almost two years on are not justifiable at all unless they serve a political purpose. So I suppose what I'm saying is that, um, that the kind of medicine we're witnessing and the kind of devotion to science that we're witnessing seems to me uh, every bit as superstitious and perhaps more superstitious as some of the devotions one finds in, in religion. And I'm thinking here more of, of non-Christian religions, although one can find it in Christian religions too. Uh, one certainly found it uh, even more uh, extensively in the religions of the empire that Christianity displaced. But I see an awful lot of that happening now. So I, I've got to got round to referring to COVID as a god and COVID science as a way of, uh, of devotion to that god, by which I mean not the hard work that, that people really doing serious research are doing, but, but the, the public overlay of devotion to the science um, which is manifestly uh, irrational in many, many cases and by no means deserving of the label science. Yeah, I mean, I'm always blown away uh, at how easily the anti-science uh, label gets thrown around, you know, 
in 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 a disagreement. I mean that that it, it it's so crazy that a disagreement about science is anti-science. You know, that's kind of like the opposite. Yes, it's anti-science yeah. to disagree to not allow disagreement in science. You know, so yeah, yeah. May, maybe that's a good point. Yeah, so I was just gonna ask. So it seems as though we're assuming that there's some sort of scientific consensus over everything related to COVID. And if you question any aspect of that consensus, whatever that consensus may be, this is some sort of God that you cannot question. And once you do, you're labeled as anti-science and then no one takes you seriously. Yes. And I think that's the, that that's, um, I, Carlos and I, I think have both witnessed that. Um, so I guess uh, another thing we, we've discussed often with Carlos is, um, it seems as though people mistake what science can tell you for morality or um, what should be done. So they will say, for example, science tells us we should wear masks. When, when in fact, science tells you, well, if you wear a mask, your chance of getting a droplet decreases by X amount, which does not directly relate to you having to wear a mask. It just relates to maybe your chances of inhaling a droplet from someone if you do not wear a mask versus if you do wear a mask. Now, what you should do does not, if you decide not to wear a mask, does not mean you're anti-science. It just means you're willing to take certain risks instead of wearing, a, like, a, you're willing to risk certain things as opposed to putting on a mask. So I, yes. I feel like, go ahead, sorry. Well, no, just, just to illustrate that, a, a colleague uh, at a different university told me a funny story. Uh, he, he, uh, occupies a building with fairly narrow hallways. And I know about this from my doctoral days and my days as a lecturer at King's London. But um, anyways, they were issued the instruction that when they met people in hallways, they were to, um, to, to turn their backs to one another and edge along, you know, so that they, they weren't any closer than, than necessary. But of course, they were also instructed to wear masks. And as we all know, the, <laughs> the droplets are one thing, but they're the minor problem. The aerosols uh, are, are, are much more serious uh, means of transmission. And the aerosols don't largely stay in these masks. And in fact, they, they go out, as you will know, uh, um, any pockets that open up. And, and quite often, they will go out out the back. So he said to the administration, so you want me to do my best to infect this colleague, do you? Um, back to back, they faced each other, drew their swords and shot each other. Um, that's the sort of level that we've, you know, that we've come to with this devotion to the science, um, rather than to particular uh, arguments about specific scientific questions. So that's that's the one level of problem. But the other is the one you point to, um, that there is, uh, I would contend, against certain Enlightenment philosophers well known, um, there is a connection between the is and the ought. And if, if science is an attempt to understand what is on a certain level of reality, certain dimensions or aspects of reality that, that um, open themselves to proper scientific analysis um, uh, uh, within the realms um, of, of um, sense data. Uh, I, I, I would maintain that there is a connection between what is and our discernment of what ought to be or what we ought to do. But as you said, it's, it's not a direct uh, and obvious connection, at least not in every instance. So um, that you learn something is a certain way does not already answer the question of what, I ought, what ought I to do with that or about that. Um, and, and those questions, those moral questions require other dimensions of, of thinking beyond what the natural sciences can provide. They, they require moral philosophy and moral theology. They require wrestling with dimensions of our reality that are not open to exploration in the same way that particle physics are or circuits in a, 
you know, in, in some electronic gadget. So to, to move from the, the scientific to the technological, but, but those two are very tightly bound together. The moral questions have to be addressed on their own grounds. And here, the, the, the most that we seem to get is, well, it's for the common good if you do what we tell you to do, because of course, we know what the common good is and we're, 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 we're genuinely seeking it. And we've been delegated to decide it on your behalf. Uh, you know, thus speaks the authority, political authority, sometimes also religious authorities. Um, and part of this new article, of course, is to is to pull apart what's going on. One of the purposes of the new article is to is to examine in more detail what is going on there and to challenge some of the false claims and the many false assumptions uh, hidden in in those claims, uh, which uh, which lead people to suppose that they must simply do as they're told rather than to think for themselves and do what their conscience uh, dictates. So actually, well, let's let's then dive into the, the, the main article. Um, I'm sorry, I think I interrupted yeah. Pericles. Oh, um, yes, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Go that's for right. it. I, I, well, I was going to ask you, basically, I, I was wondering, do you think science can be a religion if it only tells us what is and not what ought are we really worshiping maybe something that's cannot be a religion or not worshiping? Like, what is it missing? I guess. What, 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 how is it deficient as a totality? Well, yeah. So my my point, my first point there was that is that even even the very idea, the science, as you pointed out, is misleading because because science is a process of investigation that involves questions and counter questions and hypotheses and falsifications and, and the development of better hypotheses. Um, so to speak of the science of such a complex matter as the handling and, and the evolution of a, a coronavirus and indeed the creation of, of, uh, uh, of a coronavirus, um, is is rather an odd expression. Um, and so my first point was that this is being used to not to stimulate thought, but to but to suppress thought and to call instead for unquestioning obedience, which in itself is not a very scientific uh, notion or practice. Now, if you if you add the further layer of, of religious devotion to this thing you've called the science, um, then, then you get into the kind of thing that C.S. Lewis explored so powerfully in that hideous strength. Um, you, you, get, you get into a deep level confusion between what you think you can do by developing your scientific and technological capacities to manipulate nature for better or for worse and and your devotion to some um, some vision of nature which is in its way transcendent but not anchored in any genuine revelation of the transcendent but instead open to being manipulated itself. So in, in, in Lewis's book, That Hideous Strength, which is, as you probably know, is the third of a, a trilogy, um, beginning with Out of the Silent Planet and then Paralandra being the second volume, sometimes called Voyage to Venus in the American edition, I think was called Voyage to Venus. And then that hideous strength takes place uh, not on Mars or Venus, but back back on Earth, and and it's and it probes the kind of culture in which humans suppose that that they can master nature, but what happens is what always happens. It's really Lewis says as he does in his book um, the abolition of man. 
uh, right? In some ways, th th that hideous strength is just a, 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 a narratival and fictional uh, retelling or or um, uh, expression of the of the philosophical arguments in in the abolition of man. Um, but anyways, the point was that what always happens is it's not, it doesn't turn out to be humans mastering nature, this great enlightenment ideal. Uh, it turns out to be some humans mastering other humans. And then as the story unfolds, it turns out that the, the, those, those elite who are, who are mastering everybody else are themselves actually being manipulated by demonic forces. <laughs> Um, and so it, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it, I think, a, an important an analysis here um, of what happens when you deify science and so distort science instead of giving proper and due worship to the maker of all who, who, who gave um, who gave being and goodness uh, to uh, creatures in their various natures and, and gave to human beings the capacity to explore and understand those natures and to do what they ought to do by drawing the goodness that is in those natures out into new and fresh expressions of goodness. So, I mean, maybe... Uh a few more words on this, maybe connecting uh, what you mentioned earlier about how understanding what is, is indeed connected to what ought to be. Like maybe if you could expand a bit on that and maybe connect it to, you know, if science is about understanding what is, how can it not be enough to tell us what ought to be? You know, well, so yeah, uh, let's, let's take, yeah, a fairly, a fairly simple example. Um, if you know, on the general principle that what ought to be is a grateful appreciation of the goodness of what the creator has created and of the creator himself, um, an appreciation expressed by the, by the using of goods to generate good and using even in the situation that we find ourselves in where there are also evils not of god's making but of ours using even those evils for good i think we touched on this last time but but it, but allow me to repeat it even if we did the principle here is that it is never licit to do evil that good may come but it's always licit to respond both to goods and to evils in a good way. And that, and that, that allows us to, to, as it were, bring good out of evil without doing evil. Um, and so we face a, a natural um, uh, problem when we face a pandemic. Now, a pandemic, it is no longer beyond our capacity to create. And part of the whole debate around the current one is whether it was created, um, deliberately created. Um, now, you know, that goes to, to political questions, but let's set those aside for the moment and ask about how we handle the practical questions of the pandemic, whatever its origins and whatever its purposes, if it was manipulated or man-made even, um, how, do we, how do we best understand what is happening with this particular virus and its mutations? And how do we best limit the damage that it does to the human body? Let's leave aside again, the political and, and social and economic matters and just focus on those, um, those biological and medical questions. Um, science that is well done will probe um, will probe the the nature of the organism and its attacks on the human body and its means of transmission and so forth, and try to discover 
ways to prevent damage being done, try to discover um, uh, ways of addressing and if possible, bringing healing where damage has been done. And if it supplies a morally licit means for addressing a problem, and it has in fact understood the problem properly and so it's addressing something that is real and 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 it's doing so in terms that are effective and appropriate there's not there's not much of a moral judgment to be made at that point except to say well let's let's proceed with that uh, proposed uh, means of addressing the problem so long as we do so, of course, by continuing our human task of ordering our goods in a good way. So suppose I propose that I can prevent you from ever encountering COVID. Um, again, setting aside the question of whether and how injurious it is to you to encounter COVID. Um, suppose, suppose we agree that you don't wish to encounter it. And I say, well, I, I can make sure that you don't. You know, I, I, I have a room in my basement and it is secure and uh, you can live there and I will pass you food and water through the grate. Um, and when you beg me to get out, I will say, no, no, you're just having a moment of weakness. You need to stay there because I guarantee you would never encounter COVID. Well, that, that would be obviously morally absurd and ridiculous, and none of us would want that. We've been getting it, <laughs> but we don't want it um, because it's a disordering of goods. Now, you know, if you're, if you're a, um, a very... Um, uh, properly religious person who can put your time of confinement to very good use in prayer and meditation and the, the, the development of your spirit, turning that evil of isolation to the good of a better knowledge of your creator and of yourself and so forth. Um, that's fine. Um, but we would not consider it good to compel people to that. So someone wants to go and live in a, in a, uh, as a hermit on Mount Athos or something, in order to pursue those things, we say, well, good, you know, and, and we appreciate that, you know, your intentions, we appreciate what you're trying to do, we appreciate your prayers for the rest of us, this is fine. Um, but we don't, we don't send people there, they, they go because they, they, they sense a vocation to go. When we send people to isolation, it's penal. So, you know, we, we, we put people in to, into um, isolation, to, to confinement cells when we are trying to punish them. Um, now, sometimes we do it to protect them from say other prisoners who are after their, you know, uh, their head, but, but, but moral questions have to ask about the appropriateness of the behavior. Um, and so it may be a good thing to prevent someone even coming into contact with a virus, but, it's, but it isn't a good thing to demolish human um, life and to disorder the other human goods by an exclusive seeking of that good. And this, I think, you know, with all kinds of qualifications and reservations, um, is is what we've been seeing in the last almost two years, that we've been prepared to sacrifice almost every human good on some level, not completely, but sacrifice a great deal of it, um, in order to combat this one threat to our well-being which some people have encouraged us to do by making it out to be a much larger threat than it is. And um, even if it were as large as they say, it wouldn't justify the demolition of that whole hierarchy of goods that makes for human flourishing. 
so you know that that point of our previous discussions, I think, uh, is still stands. We we've enjoyed some relaxation of the restrictions and some new opening to the activities that make for human flourishing. Meanwhile, but now we've also seen draconian returns, not of not of a deadly virus, but of deadly measures such as we're seeing in Australia and Austria, for example, um, where all human goods are being subordinated to, to the supposed good of some kind of zero COVID uh, um, goal, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a, not a scientific goal in the first place, not a possible goal, um, uh, and not a good goal. Um, given the necessity in pursuing it of suppressing all these other human goods. So I, I think since we talked last, we, we've seen an escalation of the situation, not, not, um, not a, a, a pacification and a calming of the waters, but actually a, we, we have a bigger storm now. We have a bigger set of problems on, on, uh, on our hands because we have some Western nations um, uh, becoming e even more uh, draconian in their approach to this problem than China itself has been. So I guess um, on a on a just I level of ideas, the um, the proper function of science, if I understood your explanation, is it can propose many solutions that are logically sound given some state of affairs like if you don't want to catch co if you want to catch covid with probability less than epsilon science can pr propose a bunch of solutions and um you need to apply your morals to decide which one would work right i mean obviously uh i say locking everyone up forcing vaccination all all of the stuff that's happening is i guess to some degree it can be justified by evidence although not always um but it can never be a, a self-sufficient system uh, of, of dealing with things, even though, for example, I've had many discussions with, you know, other people doing PhD research and all that, that believe that there is some form of equation that we can write down that if we just optimize, you know, it will satisfy all of humanity's needs. Like maybe we reduce the sum of pain across you know everyone in the world and and we just shape the world in order to deal with that specific equation but i guess again to be in a, in a scientific framework usually when you're proposing solutions you need some constraint on that solution space like not all solutions are tenable even though they fulfill the the objectives that you set out for them so um i wonder if that kind of sums it sums it up Yes, I, I mean, I, I might remark on on the um, even the drive for for a theory of everything. Um, it, it, it tends to come out as a theory of nothing. Um, so if if you think it's a laudable goal to, um, you know, in classic utilitarian fashion to to maximize pleasure and minimize pain and you make that your highest moral goal you of course are adopting such an impossibly thin view of the human being um, as reducible to a bundle of pleasures and or pains and that that reductive view of the human being makes for a very um, uh, thin and indeed it, it, it appears consistent on the surface, but is indeed uh, um, self contradictory and self defeating at all sorts of levels as soon as you try to apply it to actual human beings. Those, those who want to apply it to the whole human race are I think a, a, a mortal threat to the race. Um, those who suppose that we ought to organize all of life in such a way as to um, make it possible 
to eradicate any viral agent that might threaten us um, are first of all madmen because you can't actually achieve that. And secondly, um, they are morally depraved men because they are working, they are working with a hierarchy of goods and a hierarchy of values that is frankly upside down. Uh, the goods of the body serve the goods of the soul. Do you if, know if they the, don't just yeah. a, do you know uh, of the Maslow hierarchy of of goods or is that what it's called Maslow hierarchy of value or something right like you have a pyramid and at the bottom is uh, bodily uh, well being and then at the top is uh, self fulfillment or something like just to, is that to yeah. you an upside down picture or does it still somehow make sense. Uh, well, no, it's 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 the right way up. It's just that it's only it's only referencing itself, whereas a genuinely sustainable moral theory has to reference the ground of the self. That is, it has to re reference the creator and whose image the self is 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 created. And if it fails to do that, it will inevitably collapse back into some kind of solipsism um, or some other form of radical reductionism. Uh, and, and frankly, to come full circle to where we began today, um, I think that's what, what we are witnessing in the willingness of so many people to accept what is manifestly absurd um that is that that having lost any any sense of what keeps uh um order in in among goods they they have they have allowed themselves to be hoodwinked into thinking that that you know curing curing all coronaviruses with some kind of universal uh um um vaccine uh perpetually injected it seems um that, that this this is a prize worth of you know worth obtaining well it is a prize worth obtaining if you own a pharmaceutical company um but it isn't if you're a human being and i guess the maybe to bring it also into this idea that it's becoming some kind of religion that and I think we also touched on this in the last one, so I don't want to go too deep into it, but the main concern that people have, I think, is not harming your neighbor directly, but contributing to the over overloading of hospitals, right? It, it, it's like some abstract uh, harm that is somehow like out there, you know? And maybe yeah. that kind of nature of it actually makes it even more difficult to just do away with. Yes, I, I, in some ways, I, I've been um, uh, uh, I don't vindicated or, or or what's the right word to say, but to use uh, um, in again in the time since our last conversation, um, at at which time I had been doing some work here locally in Quebec, but also look. Uh, you know, looking at Canada specifically, um, uh, not not much larger scale than Canada, um, to see what was actually happening in the in the hospitals, because because I think you know even even if you're covering up your own selfish concern, will will there be a hospital bed for me if I need it? What why you know whatever the reason I need it. Um, and, and you're covering that up by talking about love of your neighbor. You really don't mean that you love your neighbor. You mean that you want your neighbor to love you in such a way that there will always be a bad for you when, when, when you require it. Even, even if you, you know, look at that scenario, um, you, you, may, you may be dealing with um, with uh, uh, an attitude of what's most important for me is that I don't face 
illness, disease, or death without the medical science's best efforts to, you know, to save me. Um, and so if I were talking with such a person, I would, I would want to say, well, is, is that, is that a, a healthy view, either of yourself or of your neighbor? <laughs> is, it, is, it a, is it a solid and sound and, and, and dignified view of, of what a human being is capable of and is good for? And is it a realistic view? In, I mean, at some point, nobody's going to be able to save you, right? <laughs> You're going to die. Um, and you know, even that even the transhumanists aren't going to be able to save you. They might be able to save your memory bank, but they're not saving you. Um, so, so I thought, you know, in the previous century, our philosophers, especially our existentialist philosophers, had 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 tried to help us wrestle with the fact that we were mortal and we'd better think about everything in those in that light. But clearly, they failed to 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 teach us how to think well about death, and about the nature of our mortality, or about its causes, or about the the possible cure for it. Which, of course, what Christianity was all about, uh, as Solovyov uh, makes very very clear in his in his book uh, War, Progress, and the End of History. You know, the the hole at the heart of our modern culture even where it pretends to be Christian, is it doesn't really believe in the resurrection of the dead. And therefore it is, it, it has no solution to offer to our major problem. And it goes around seeking all sorts of false and pseudo solutions, which will eventually destroy it. Um, and people need to read that book for themselves, a wonderful book. You want, you want to read it slowly and, 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 and ponder it. Um, but at any rate, uh, the, coming back to the hospital question, if we're that kind of person who's just trying to avoid any kind of unaddressed suffering, and so we wanna make sure they're hospital beds, then let us ask the question of, A, have we ever been short of hospital beds in this last two years in a way that we're not normally short at certain times of year? And from what research I've done, the answer to that is no. Except for this, um, we are now experiencing a situation in which, not in which healthcare workers are off sick with COVID on a large scale, but healthcare workers are either off sick with psychological problems and burnout, or they're off on union grounds because of, of mistreatment or claimed mistreatment, as the case may be, um, or they are just afraid to come back to work. And consequently, our hospitals are um, suffering from the fact, not that we have too few beds, but that we have too few staff. And that is now being exacerbated by the fact that we have these course of mandates and some people are saying, well, I would rather quit than take that treatment because I've seen too many examples of it hurting people. I'm not taking it myself. So I would rather quit and lose my job. So we increase the shortage that way. Now here in Quebec, the government backed down once it realized how many people would quit. Uh, but that's not true everywhere. It is also true in some states now that the governments are backing down and say, well, we actually can't afford to lose all these healthcare workers, so we'll stop with the course of mandate. Um, uh, but there's, a, there's one more factor that I can think of there. Um, uh, there are probably others. Um, but in connection with the... Uh, the damages known and unknown which these mRNA treatments and uh, are producing um, there and and in connection with the lockdowns which prevented people from having routine maintenance uh, uh, medicine we are we are in danger I don't say it'll happen just that we are in danger 
of of fulfilling the prophecy of an overburdened healthcare system, not because of COVID, but because of our response to COVID. And so I don't know whether the medical care system will be overwhelmed in the future, but I'm pretty confident from my own studies that it has not been overwhelmed in the past by COVID, but insofar as it's been overwhelmed at all, it's been overwhelmed by our responses to COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of this business. Well, you have to do this uh, to make sure there are hospital beds. There's, there's, no, there's no point in having hospital beds if there aren't staff to care for the people in them. And that's, and, and that's the problem that we are facing where we are facing a problem. Uh, we won't give early treatment. We won't keep people at home. Uh, uh, and and uh, treat them. We keep them at home only until they're too sick and then they come in the hospital and lo and behold, there aren't enough people to treat them because those people are afraid to be there and so forth. They've bought into this whole culture of fear. So we've, we've generated a number of, of, of um, vicious cycles of, um, of self-injury through this obsession with, with avoiding a coronavirus that kills still on average people at age 85 when people die anyway is a point I've met, made many times and that many others have made many times, but doesn't seem to have sunk in yet. Uh, back to the question of, well, are we mortal? If we are mortal, um, when we get into our 80s, should we expect to die? Yes, if you make it to your 80s, you better be anticipating death pretty soon. Question is, how are we preparing for it? And how do we live the lives we have before we die? Uh, Christianity has always claimed that that has a good deal to, to, to do with, with, uh, with the life we will live after we've died. And not just Christianity, but you know, even, even, even the Platonists and, and, uh, and uh, all, all the, the, the pagan religions that believed in reincarnation thought the same. Uh, their solution was was certainly very different from the one that Christianity proposes that Salavia puts his finger on. But but it's but it's um, it it belongs to being human to think about how well you live and not merely how long you live. We seem to have fundamentally lost sight of that, and that that is perhaps the most worrisome thing about this whole business in my mind it it it's revealing the shallowness of our thinking about what it means to be human and and so again i say that that brings us back to where we started yeah and definitely two years on it it becomes harder and harder to deny that that we're ignoring the, the quality of life aspect. Um, okay, but I think now we've had a good intro. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one, uh, one hour and a bit. Nice, uh, <laughs> nice hour introduction. <laughs> All right. And like Professor, one of my lectures. <laughs> yeah. um, it, of course, uh, I forgot to ask you this earlier, but if you have any other meetings or any, any other uh, stuff to get no, to, I'm, I'm, let us know. No, I'm, I'm fine. Yes, I'm fine. Drinking coffee at 11 p.m., so I'm good to go as well. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so um, now we, we can get into uh, this article, which is in one sentence, maybe what should people do when facing this situation, right? Uh, as a political action, I guess, or something like that. So if you could give us a, a quick overview of the main arguments and the structure of, of the article, um, and then we'll probably come up with questions along the way. Sure. So I'll try to do that briefly. Um, and I set this one up so that the um, the, the disputatio uh, methodology um, didn't get obscured. Um, the, the, it's front loaded. <laughs> so you know there there are. Um, there's the question and the four objections that I propose, and admittedly, I conflate a few into each of those, but uh, that's fine. And then the answer, and then the answer to the objections or the reply to the objections, and all of that only takes a couple of pages, and then we go into a more discursive um, 
uh, treatment uh, or examination of it. But let, let me just say at the outset that that the, the question itself, whether there is a moral obligation to disobey the coercive mandates is, um, is a kind of um, counter charge to, to those who, whom I was addressing in the earlier uh, piece, whether there is a moral obligation to be vaccinated because the, the whole push at, at, at that time and still at this time is that is that one ought to subject oneself to these treatments, and um, and that all right thinking people will do so, and certainly all people of goodwill will do so. And since we talked last, there's been uh, a lot of talk about the uh, not only the the. the the medical threat of those who don't subject themselves to the treatments, but the moral threat of such people. So I'm taking that, grasping that bull by the horns and saying, no, you know, actually what we ought to be talking about is whether we have a moral obligation to disobey these mandates. Um, when, when it was an option to take one of these treatments, one could calmly look at the relative, um, you know, risk and benefits of the treatment for different people in different groups and try to reach sensible decisions about whether uh, I or someone else would benefit from, from taking the treatment. But once we get once we get to the point of saying, oh, we've already decided for everybody, everybody must take it, a needle in every arm, right? Um, then uh, those who, who resist are viewed as a threat, uh, both morally and, and politically on the one hand and medically on the other hand. Now, now, now medically, this is nonsense. Uh, we've we've learned that the treatments don't stop transmission. They don't stop hospitalization. They don't stop mortality amongst those who are likely to need hospi uh, uh, hospitalization and mortality, uh, or, or or to face mortality rather, um, face death. Um, but nevertheless, these memes that have been well well um, prepared uh, have stuck. Uh, the, the notion that people who won't take it are somehow morally perverse and the notion that because of these people, the pandemic will continue and in continuing will overwhelm the hospitals. That's, that's the narrative that's been built and it's been built for a spe specific purpose to herd people into the cubicles where they get the injections. Um, and I've already argued uh, at some length that uh, that there's a reason for wanting to do that, and the reason is not to uh, uh, to overcome COVID. The reason is to make a lot of money on the way to overcoming the kind of uh, the kind of political structure in which people determine their own uh, lives and their own. Uh, temporal um, goals and their own political structures. In other words, COVID is for the vaccines, so-called, and the vaccines are for the vaccine passports. That's been my basic line of argument. The, 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 um, the end game here is to have everybody uh, 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 QR coded, tracked and traced at all times. And those who argue that the passports are merely temporary are going to have a tough road to hoe to convince me <laughs> of that. Um, uh, the, the passports are really what it's all about as far as I can make out. Now, enormous sums of money are being made by a small uh, group of people on the way to those passports. Um, but I don't think it can all be addressed in just economic terms. 
yeah, there are political issues here. And the political issues are closely tied to the question of what is good for human beings. So in that context, I've, I've tried, as it were, to up the ante here by, say, by asking the question, a moral theology question, uh, whether there is in fact an obligation, morally speaking, to disobey these coercive mandates. And the word coercive is important because it's not an argument the, the previous article was an argument about whether there was a moral obligation to, to be vaccinated or whether the only moral obligation is to think about the question of being vaccinated and try to reach a good answer. But once we get past the invitation to, to take one of these um, treatments to a command that you must take it, that question effectively becomes moot, right? What's the new question? The new question is whether I should or should not support and obey the course of mandate in question. And I am arguing here in this piece that, that there are very good reasons for refusing support and for active resistance for civil and even uh, ecclesial, ecclesial or religious um, disobedience. So uh, how do I do that? Well, quite uh, simply by putting the best case uh, I, I can together for um, obedience and acceptance of the mandates and obedience to them. Uh, and then uh, trying to take that apart piece by piece and, and show that the arguments do not stand up and to put in their place a counter argument that, in, that uh, I've already indicated, namely that one, morally speaking, ought to oppose the mandates and, and not merely to oppose in principle, but to oppose in practice, uh, to resist them. And so in the end, um, I come around to, to a, a, an admonition, <laughs> a, 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 a plea really, uh, to, to take that course of action for the good of your own soul and the good of your neighbor and the good of humanity. Now there's an awful lot of ground covered in between touching on matters, uh, medical matters, uh, political, as well as matters moral and spiritual. Um, and we can go into the parts of that that most interest you. Carlos? Oh, okay. So, yeah, I was trying I to move myself, go? but I wanted to share screen. But Perry, go for it. <laughs> no, no, I was wondering do we want to go point by point or do we want to just attack uh, separate issues uh, as they come? I think it could be interesting to go point by point this time. Um, yeah, sure. I, I, I can share. Uh, there's, my there's four points. Yeah, yeah so there are thing. four points. I have them here. There four, are four objections. Go, Perry. No, no. Uh, I think we can. I, I think it's a good idea to go point by point. So, just to summarize, I guess the first point is just, I guess, basically that, that if there's an authority in charge, uh, we, we we should obey them, right? That's the that's the first objection. Yeah. So so the 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 first objection is based on the fact that that authority is necessary for the functioning uh, and the well being of of any society, and and that's that's a reflection of the creator's authority, um, and and so we ought we ought to have. Um, a predisposition to obedience to properly constituted authority. So and I is, guess, and I guess you go ahead, Carlos. I was just going to say, is the necessity for an authority some kind of um, byproduct of the fact that we can't all be authorities, so somebody has to be an authority? I can't just decide what's right for everyone else and act entirely in that manner. So we need to yield our own judgments to some degree, I suppose, right? Well, that's objection three. So it, these oh, are organically these are organically related. The, the first one simply establishes the principle that authority in itself is is a, a good and necessary thing, um, 
and it is intended for human good. Um, where it actually serves human good, it, it's, it should certainly be obeyed. Um, the, the, the second objection is that uh, the, to the idea of disobedience is that maybe, maybe your, um, your inclination to disobey is simply, you know, you're rubbed the wrong way by the fact that, um, that authority is intervening in your life in new ways. So for example, you don't chafe too much that you have to renew your driver's license every five years or that you have to have a driver's license. It's a, it's a burden. It, it, it costs you money. It's annoying. You might have to stand in line, et cetera, et cetera. But you recognize that it's, it's necessary to have some means of controlling what happens on the road. So, so you live with that. Um, but now you're being told, well, you can't go out in the road after a certain hour, or you can't go more than a certain distance, um, or you can't go at all. And so you're chafing at the tightening of regulations. But there are situations in which regulations have to be tightened for the common good. So, so um, when the authorities, on the presumption that authority is good and that the authorities are acting with your best interests in view, tell you, well, right now we, you know, we need to, we need you to do this. We need you to do that. We need you not to do the other thing that you normally do. Um, you shouldn't, you shouldn't chafe too much at that because, because um, there are times when extraordinary measures are needed and we live in such a time. Then the third one voices the objection that you were alluding to, um, that we can't all be individually the judge of whether we live in such a time. Um, it, it's a collective judgment and, and the buck has to stop someplace and it doesn't stop with you. You, you get to say, as I am frequently saying, no, this is not such a time. This is not such a time. The, the coronavirus is not the most serious crisis we've faced since the Second World War, as Klaus Schwab would have it and, and, and others of that ilk. No, it's not. It's not even close to that. Um, so, but ostensibly, neither Klaus Schwab nor myself get to decide that. Now, I'm well aware of the fact that I don't get to decide it, but I'm not quite convinced that he's not among those who are deciding it illegitimately because he is not a legitimate authority, but he and others like him are working to rearrange our conception of legitimate authority into these so-called public-private partnerships, whereby um, states act in concert with other stakeholders <laughs> And, and you're included only if insofar as you fit into, uh, into that axis or, or willing to turn on, on that axis. Um, and that raised a whole other set of problems, which I can't deal with here in this article about legitimate authority, state sovereignty and so forth. And, and I do allude to them, but I can't treat them in detail. But the point of objection three is to say, look, Farrell, you know, shut up already. You, you don't get to decide this. Um, and then the fourth objection, uh, we may as well finish these off, um, <laughs> is that if you, if you disobey, you are rightly punished. So those of you who are reading this article, which is urging you, if necessary, to civil disobedience, uh, should bear in mind that it is right and proper for us to punish you if you actually do that. Um, and so even there can be less formal forms of punishment for less formal forms of non-cooperation. Um, that also I've tried to embrace in objection four. 
and uh, one one might one might add, of course, other objections or tease out ones that are buried in one of these four. But I think that more or less captures the gist of the argument against any form of of civil disobedience, or uh, because I'm dealing also with uh, with a, a, a specifically Christian audience here. Um, the question of disobedience to one's bishops, because one's bishops are basically serving <laughs> these days as echo chambers for one's politicians. Um, and, and so the question of, of th there's, a, there's a tension here in this piece between what it means to exercise civil disobedience and what are the appropriate conditions for that and what it would mean to exercise ecclesial or ecclesiastical disobedience, which, which is a a related analogous but distinct question. I have brought them together in this piece to some extent. Um, yeah. So um, the the first thing uh, going back to objection one is, uh, is it fair to say that the that public health is a common good? Uh, like, Maybe in in a in a setting where you have uh, public health care, I, I think maybe you could say that. Would that change in a setting where you have private health care, okay. where each individual is responsible for their health? And at that point, maybe we can make an, a, a can't make a case for authority in that domain. Yeah, obviously, obviously, handling questions like this requires casuistry. That is, one one has to. Th Think about particular cases. It, 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 as in as in moral science, like like the, the so-called natural or physical sciences, is is always having to move back and forth between between principles and 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 the application of principles, and to test the principles in the application and and the applications by the principles. This is always a a, a two-way street here. So when you ask a question about, um, say, the impact of a of a, a, a healthcare system that is predominantly a publicly funded and publicly um, controlled one versus one that's privately funded and has more flexibility, that does introduce a whole important layer of questioning. I've not tried to deal with it here, um, but I could say very quickly that that. Even, even with a system that depends heavily on, on, on private medicine, um, there have to be some common standards and um, there also have to be some common actions. So um, if on your way home from your private medical appointment that you have paid for and, and you've chosen the, the physician you want and the treatment you want and so forth, um, you're, you're passing through um, garbage-strewn uh, streets with rats and, and you know, carrying bubonic plague. Um, <laughs> uh, your, 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 your nice little um, beautification procedure or whatever it was, your life-saving cancer treatment that, that, that you went through, you know, at your clinic isn't going to do you much good if you get the black death on the way home, right? So, so um, there are always dimensions of, of, of the common good, which just go down to practical questions like, do they pick up the garbage in this city or is it Rome? I'm sorry, um, <laughs> you know, is it, you know do, do they care for, um, for the general cleanliness of society? Now that can get turned totally upside down where you, where you have people, and I fear that Fauci and some of these people are like this, you know, um, you, you, you get phobic about any kind of virus or bacterial agent that, that, that might threaten you. Um, so you can, be, you can become falsely obsessed with that. They're always, the mean between two extremes is generally what's good for the common, you know, what fits the common good. You don't get all carried away trying to eradicate every possible coronavirus, um, nor, do you, nor do you simply say, well, you know, sure, sneeze on your neighbor, you know, at a time when you're facing, you know, uh, some serious threat of, of, of viral infection. Uh, you have to find something in between.
between those two extremes if you're going to tend to the common good. All right, very good, Perry, go for it. No, no, I, I, I think that uh, I, I was just wondering, should we just maybe go through all the, uh, the arguments against it? Yeah, let's, let's go for it. So now we, we covered the objections, which again, you explained last time, aren't objections to your point, but uh, objections in a different sense, right? Just to remind the setup. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, to help the reader who's not, who's not overly familiar with the disputatio format, um, by the way, I, I had another colleague, a very, very able colleague um, in philosophy who, who read this piece and said, why don't we use this format much more frequently? Why did we let it go with the Middle Ages? I mean, this is really helpful. So I was, I was obviously pleased to hear that. But um, uh, I didn't have an answer to the question of why we let it go, although I could, uh, at least I didn't offer one. I probably could if we had another session. Now, um, so the way this works is that uh, the question being asked whether there is a moral obligation to disobey the course of mandates um, is addressed, first of all, with arguments contrary to the argument I am going to make, which is that we do have a moral obligation. Now, you, you don't know from the title of these, you know, of these disputation questions for sure which way the, the presenter is going to go with the argument. But as soon as you start reading the objections, the objections are clearly to the argument that the, that the uh, philosopher, or in this case, theologian in question, is going to, to uh, put. So I am going to be arguing that there is a moral obligation to disobey. The objectors are saying, no, no, there's not. In fact, you know, there's a moral obligation to obey, <laughs> right? So I try to pose their arguments in those first four paragraphs, obviously in condensed fashion and much more could be said, but I try to get the main lines of the argument against my position out in the open and to put them as fairly and as, as persuasively as I can. Um, and, um, and so there's a constant appeal to authority throughout because in, in the disputatio uh, frame of reference, uh, there's, no, there's no shame in appealing to authority. I, you, you appeal to your betters, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're inclined to, to say, well, as Einstein said, um, <laughs> You know, we, we still do that, and they did it too, but they would, you know, they, they, they were uh, um, uh, not just doing that to make you think that they were clever because they had read Einstein or Plato or whomever it was. I think mean, there can be a bit of that going on, but, but, um, but you're appealing to people who have thought hard about these things, and you're, you're building on their arguments, so you're giving sources. You're not using footnotes, but you're giving quotations and and uh, sending people to the places where they can go to find out more about this, right? So then when you get to the said contra, the, the, the on the contrary, um, you're usually appealing to a key authority at that point. In this case, I appealed to two, St. Augustine and Pope Leo XIII, um, who articulate the principles with which I want to work in making my argument. And then comes my argument. I answer that. One is obligated to resist unjust laws. And to do so not only as I'm doing it right now by disputatio, but also if necessary to do it by civil disobedience. Now, what's the if necessary part? Nobody, nobody should desire civil disobedience for its own sake that that there is a legitimate objection to its objection one but when might it be necessary to do that well the qualification i give here is it's necessary whenever obedience would violate the conscience or direct others away from the common good and that's a both and because well it's a, it's an either or but it could be a both and um, it's, 
there are two things to consider here, whether my conscience, more or less well-formed as it is, I'm still obligated to obey it. I, I have a moral obligation to form my conscience as well as possible, to inform it and reform it where it needs it, but I'm always responsible to obey it at whatever state of readiness it is, because if we disobey our consciences, then the whole moral enterprise collapses. But there's also the other, the neighbor. Um, maybe I can do this with a clear conscience or refuse to do it with a clear conscience, but what is the impact on my neighbor? So to give an illustration, St. Paul is writing to the Corinthian Christians uh, and, and he says, look, you know, a lot of you have come out of, out of um, uh, you know, you're Gentiles, you've come out of, out of idol worship and, and uh, part of the rituals that you used to participate in is slaughtering an animal to a particular god or goddess and then sharing a feast, you know, uh, that the sort of pagan version of the Eucharistic feast. Um, now, people who've come out of that and who don't want anything to do with those gods have some of them conscientious objections to eating meat that was sacrificed to the gods, even though their gods aren't there. That is, they're not in the presence of the gods. They've just bought the meat at the market, but still it was dedicated to the gods in question. So they have moral scruples about eating it. And Paul says, look, your conscience isn't well formed here. <laughs> Those gods can't change the meat. <laughs> And as long as you're thankful to the true creator for the meat, um, you don't have to ask questions about where the meat came from, right? Don't you be going where it's being dedicated to false gods. You can't eat at the table of the false gods and the table of the true God, but you can eat meat. Uh, if, you, if you understand this properly, you can even eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols, so long as you're not sacrificing to idols. However, he says, this is where the common good comes in. I'm not going to do it if I have a bunch of brethren around who, whose consciences aren't well formed in this and who are scandalized by what I'm doing. Because it's more important to direct them to the good of unity and the faith than it is to clear up this particular issue. So I'll, I'll refrain. I, I myself will go vegetarian tonight because <laughs> I'm surrounded by vegetarians who are scandalized by me, my eating meat, you see, that because it's been possibly sacrificed to an idol. Um, now, anyone who knows, you know, about the context there can, can say, well, yeah, you're, you know, you're taking liberties, fine. Um, but the point is, you have to, you have to concern yourself with your accountability to your moral reason and your accountability, frankly, for your moral reason. Are you, are you neglecting the task of, of learning to discern and do the good? Because if you can't discern the good, you can't do it. And, and you have a responsibility to learn to shape and reshape and strengthen and deepen your conscience. Conscience is not some kind of of um, oracle that speaks out of nowhere the absolute truth. It is a kind of oracle in the sense that it always reminds you that you are accountable to the truth. But if you don't know the truth, and you should know it, you're accountable for that too. If you don't know it and you couldn't know it, you're not accountable in the same way. Um, and so that's one end of it. What about me? Am I thinking straight? Am I doing the necessary work to be a moral person? Um, but the other is, once I think I've got things straight, what impact am I having on others? Now, that's, that's, we're more familiar at the moment with that. Well, you should get vaccinated because others will feel more comfortable if you are. Notwithstanding the fact that they're busy transmitting it to one another, even though they're vaccinated, <laughs> they will feel more comfortable because they've been taught to fear the unvaccinated. So shouldn't you be vaccinated even just to make them feel more comfortable, right? Um, I'm again turning the tables on that, not only by saying that, that 
that would be a very weak reason for being vaccinated if I had any strong reasons that the particular uh, injection in question, which is not, as I've said before, a, 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 a traditional vaccine, uh, is really a threat to me. Um, but it's very weak reasoning because the, as far as I can make out at any rate, people have been taught to think that way by people who are manipulating and abusing them politically, economically, and medically. Um, and so what is needed here is actually a stand against that. But by laying out the principles that it's not a kindness to cooperate in the loss of a greater good in pursuit of some lesser good, and it's not a kindness to go along with a slide into greater evil. That's Augustine, right? Laying out that principle and Pope Leo's, that if you find authorities using, abusing their authority to, to give approval to and even make demands of, of, uh, regarding something that is not good but hurtful, is not helpful but harmful. You must not regard yourself as obligated to that just because it is said by an authority. You must, in fact, help your neighbor by resisting this abuse of authority. To bring it to a contemporary example that's not so contemporary as COVID, um, but is most more clear to most people, um, there comes a point where Rosie Parks' conscience says, you know, damn it all, I'm, <laughs> I am not going to sit at the back of the bus. Why? Not because I don't get to the place I'm trying to go. Not because it's not comfortable with my fellow uh, Black Americans, but because it's wrong to cooperate with this dehumanizing of my people. So I'm going to the front. It's, Ill, it's, it's against the rules. You know, people say to me when I'm somewhere, which is not infrequent, where I'm supposed to be wearing a mask, but I won't wear one. Well, you're, you know, you're breaking the rules. Yes, the, the question is, who's making the rules? On with what authority are they making the rules? And what's the effect of those rules? So she decided that people didn't have the authority to make blacks sit at the back of the bus. And she went to the front. Other people were, were convicted that she was right and the authorities were wrong and they started supporting her. And eventually we got rid of those kinds of laws and, 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 and made some major changes. Uh, not enough changes, of course, and there's all kinds of complications since then, as we know. But, um, but this is, this is a, you know, a base. We all mostly will agree that civil disobedience is sometimes the right thing to do. The question is, is it called for here in this instance? And that, that's the sort of thing I'm wrestling with. And I'm, I'm saying it is called for. Um, and I go on to try to, to explain why. So is there uh, a need for some kind of authority outside of our authorities so that all of this can work? Like, um, you know, the, the earthly authorities have to sort of be answering to some truth, some objective truth that we also have some intuition about in order to be able to sort of check them, uh, I guess. Um, yes. And, okay. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and of course, this is where if you um, say, uh, I mentioned in moral theory, the, the utilitarians earlier, um, let's appeal now in, in the sphere of, of legal theory to positivists, you know, who, who like the utilitarians in the moral sphere, don't want to go to questions of whether something is inherently right or wrong, but only to the question of does it have the desired effect? So you can do that with pleasure, pain, real uh, 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 tensions, right? Um, there's nothing inherently wrong in any particular uh, activity of say eating or or having sex or whatever. It's only a question of, does it produce net pleasure over net pain? 
Um, well, in law, the, 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 the extension of that kind of thinking, and, it, and, it, and it, it, it did occur as an extension of that kind of thinking, um, there, there were other factors, but they're very much bound together. It, the, the, the positivists will say, well, you know, law, law is not um, a question of adhering as well as possible to some intrinsically um, good arrangement of things. Law is, is, has its force simply by the fact that we have law givers who, who give this law. It's self-referential entirely. And um, so then once you take that approach, um, uh, you don't ask the kind of question that Leo is asking you to ask. You, 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 don't, um, you don't say um, that uh, if anyone by any author in authority uh, sanctions something that's out of conformity with right reason and the principles of right reason and is as such obviously and necessarily hurtful to the to the common good um, that that can have no binding force you you say no it has binding force if it's established by the authorities in question and you can ask other questions about how long you want to be under those authorities, whether there's another jurisdiction that you could go to or whatever. But the law is the law and you simply obey it because it is the law. And then you get into your power games about who's going to make the laws, right? It, it becomes a question of, of getting your party in charge so that you can craft or recraft the laws. And that's, that's the whole game but everybody must obey the laws that are crafted by whomever is in power. Well, that is, that is an extremely deficient theory from a moral perspective, precisely because as you were uh, inquiring or uh, um, alluding to, authority is itself something that is good only in so far as it is grounded in the good God. <laughs> You know, the, the, the creator does have authority over his creation and the creator is good. And so authority is good and authority is is manifested by humans in their own relation and in the larger biblical uh, um, worldview, it's manifested by angels as well who serve God and serve humans. But um, but but it's it's good insofar as it reflects the goodness of God, and it is perverse and evil insofar as it is as it presumes to um, attack and undermine the goodness of God. And when it when it does that, yeah, and by the goodness of God, I don't just mean the goodness of God Himself, but the goodness of God as it is reflected in the creation itself, and therefore in say human nature. So if you, if you um, decide that um, something that is contrary to the good of humans will be the law, what Leo is saying, the good person will refuse to obey that law. Yeah. And it is right and just to refuse to obey it. Yeah, and that leaves a question of discernment, and it's a corporate, not just merely an individual discernment, but, it, but we know that this happens and and uh, and indeed, you know, just to uh, stop with this, but uh, but in the present situation, we know that our fundamental laws, our laws in in say in Canadian uh, constitutional law, um, and many other countries, uh, are are laws that protect basic liberties, rights and freedoms, as we call them. Um, and we know that much of what is being done is contrary to those basic laws. So we do it through emergency powers. And I have to raise a question in here, and I do raise the question as to whether those emergency powers are being abused or properly used. Um, to override fundamental rights and freedoms. And my claim, of course, is that they are being abused. And one of the obvious evidences for that is that the law 
arranges for them for very short periods of time, but we have been using them by automatic renewals of emergency powers long after any emergency can actually be demonstrated. And in order to justify that, we have to keep pretending that we can that we have an emergency and finding new ways, Omicron or whatever it is, to insist that there's an emergency when there is in fact no emergency. So the, 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 this is like the uh, the counterpoint to objection two, um, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So so I I had a question about this actually. So later on, because I think you expand upon a reply to objection two uh, quite a bit. Uh, later on, yes. Um, there's one point that struck me. Um, so you, you bring up uh, the point that it, it seems like we're almost uh, risking the lives of children to protect uh, people that are very advanced in age, and whether that's, um, I guess, we're questioning whether that's a good thing or not. Well, uh, we, well, here, here, my question is: Is it really cut and dry that that should not be the case? Is there a moral obligation to to are we morally obliged to protect the children uh, for this uh, and risk the elders as, op as opposed to the reverse? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's not, it's not altogether simple. So for example, in some um, Eskimo type cultures, you know, um, when someone becomes elderly or sick enough that they impede the chances of survival of the of the of the extended family or tribe as it moves across the ice say um seeking sustenance and and so forth that that those people um uh might be just left behind right so um the same could be said um, in in a in a retreat from a battlefront, you know, where you know we call people heroes if they rescue the guy left behind, but they're not ordered to do that in every case because there's no point in having two dead soldiers instead of one, right? Um, so we have to wrestle with this kind of question all the time. Um, but to come back to the to the example of the um, northern native tribe, say that was practicing such a thing, and I'm not approving or disapproving of it in this point in the argument. I'm just using it as an illustration. Um, you you don't leave behind the little ones because you've got to carry them. <laughs> um, you leave behind the old ones whose lives are, are, you know, it's great hardship for them to carry on, but it also, they, they can't carry on for much longer. I mean, they are not going to live much longer. And again, I'm, I'm not arguing in favor of that. I'm only saying that there's a, there's a kind of natural instinct that you preserve the next generation. Why do parents sacrifice for their children? Because their children are the hope of the future. And, and they will, you know, we use the expression, I work myself to the bone to make, to provide a living for my family. So yeah, I'm gonna die 10 years earlier than I would have, cause I worked a whole lot harder to, you know, to take care of my, my children. But, I, but that's part of what being human in, in, the, in this world means, you know, I, 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 I should make sacrifices for the young. Now we've come to a place in our society where we are being told that the young and healthy are a threat to the old and infirm. And so even though we're using experimental medicines and admitting, not always, but sufficient, there are sufficient admissions from all sides, um, that this is an experiment, the outcome of which we do not know like the infamous or notorious statement of, of the, the fellow on the panel, uh, the FDA, who said, well, how will we know if it hurts children unless we give it to them? <laughs> um, so let's get on with it. <laughs> um, 
we, we are using children as guinea pigs and we are using the excuse that though we know that they don't die from this, right? And they don't even get seriously sick unless they're seriously sick for some other reason. A very small percentage of children um, could suffer seriously from COVID because they suffer seriously already from something else that makes them weak against COVID. But in the larger population, the, the, the um, mortality rate from COVID amongst children is something like, I forget, it's 0.007% or something like that. It's minuscule, it's not, it's, it's for all practical purposes, zero. Um, and not only that, they hardly ever get seriously sick from it. So the story is that we need to inject them uh, because since they're not seriously sick from it, they carry it all over the place. They don't even think about it and they give it to granny and granny dies. Well, th this is a nonsense narrative. First of all, granny's gonna die anyways, uh, but setting that aside because she might not die right now and we don't want her to die right now. Um, we know that injected people transmit the disease. So, we're going to vaccinate children for what reason now and i guess granny can take the vaccine if she wanted to anyways right exactly <laughs> uh but now now we're going to go out and we are going out and seducing children into this you will here, here's the stick granny will die if you don't take this here's the carrot you're a superhero if you take this and in fact we'll give you ice cream and lollipops um you know this is so wrong this is so wrong that I don't even have words for it. We are asking children who cannot give informed consent because they couldn't understand the science even if we explained it to them, but we don't explain it. Who have no idea that their risks of suffering from this situation are going from zero to something over uh, 1%. And that's only of damage that we know about. We have no idea what the long-term damage is going to be from this stuff. We'd like to think there won't be any, and wouldn't that be wonderful? But we don't know that, and we have reason to doubt it. So the idea that you will take young people and seduce or even them or even coerce their parents by saying, well, they can't go, you know, can't go to school, can't go to the rink, can't, can't do any of these things. Um, in, into taking these, these medicines and being part of the experiment. I use the word medicine somewhat loosely here. Um, to me, th this, this is fundamentally immoral. And it, it, if you want a canary in the coal mine <laughs> in terms of morality, the fact that we're doing this tells us that morality is dead. And is I don't know much uh, the history of, uh, of vaccinations, but uh, I have a feeling that this might be the first one that we give, we mandate to people who don't need it. Like there's obviously uh, polio vaccines and uh, chicken pox and all these, which we gladly give to children for most part. And I don't know if they're also mandated, but I think those are always given because they're uh, protecting the children from a specific threat, not because it might then transmit to somebody else. Is, is this a, a shift that, that this brought about? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, the children are at risk of, of tuberculosis or measles or um, smallpox or whatever it is. So, so in terms of your tests for, for, your, you know, your moral tests for doing this, um, the fact that they are at risk, yes, you're vaccinating healthy people, people who are not yet sick. The point is to keep them from getting sick. Um, but with children and COVID, they're not getting sick. So, so you're in a completely different situation morally there. You're not doing it for the children. You're doing it for some other reason. Now, the ostensible reason is to protect granny. I, I, cannot long, I cannot give any credence to that, both because we know that the injections don't prevent transmission. 
they're non-sterilizing in, uh, injections. They do not prevent transmission. So granny's just as much at risk later as she is afterwards, as she is beforehand. Um, and knowing that, that that is the case and that we know that is the case, um, the fact that we are still using that as a, as a reason tells me that the real reason is something much different and much more objectionable, something that in some people's minds is justifying exposing children to threats that were no threat to them. If polio were not a threat to children, you wouldn't vaccinate children against polio. So what's going on here? Why are we doing this? There's some other reason. Now, I've, I've already proffered my, my main answer, which is that the needle in every arm, literally every arm, and now it looks like literally every three to six months, is an enormous profit-making machine. That's one reason. But the other reason that I've proffered, and I'm not the only one to do it, um, is that it is a necessary step to get society to the point of universal databases, universal tracking and tracing, universal surveillance, universal um, um, rights to perform experiments to modify the human being, even at, at the level of their biological functioning. And sometimes people will point out, well, yeah, but we're not modifying their genome. Well, probably not, although we're not actually sure what the in the epigenetic cycle, what's happening here, but um, but the WHO has just approved uh, in principle, the idea that there would be genome uh, um, alterations, even germline alterations. So when and under what circumstances hasn't been said, it's not being said with connection to COVID, but, but we, we are clearly going down a path of of experimenting with the building blocks of human life. And some people are very excited about that. Uh, other people are still very cautious, but that's the atmosphere in which we are, are working. So it's not just money, it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the power to perform experiments that we want to perform. And it's, I think above all, this political, and economic move to tie all privileges, what we used to call rights and are now merely privileges dispensed by the government to a system of complete uh, electronic surveillance of human uh, activity. And again, if, if, if I were making all that up, you would just say, well, you know, that's, sci-fi stuff and 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 dystopian stuff why would you why would you raise that prospect but where do i get it from i get it from the people working and thinking in the same spheres that the klaus schwabs of this world are working and thinking i get it from their sites i get it from their articles uh, i get it from their ambitions and from their claims so i know that it's i know that they have it in mind and I see it happening around me in this situation. And I think, well, you put two and two together. So um, I think we're going to start to wrap it up since we're getting to the two hour mark. Um, but I wanted to just get to the, I guess, the crux of, of the article, which is this uh, notion of, of uh, disobedience. Uh, yeah. And if you could say a bit about what form you think would be most productive, given that you know, we accept all of this, all of these premises, and this is something that's uh, contradictory to our conscience and conscious uh, consciences. Um, what you, what do you think is the most productive way to to respond as an individual? Yeah. So, so just before I answer that, let me let me say to your readers who haven't or viewers who haven't yet read the article that that uh, as you pointed out earlier, uh, a good chunk of the article is spent addressing 
the the questions uh, which I raised in response to objection to um, the 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 questions um, that uh, concern um, that that are necessary to answer in order to to know whether the extraordinary powers the emergency powers that are being used and the way they are being used is indeed for the common good because if it really is for the common good um uh, not contrary to the good of the individual because the common good can't ultimately be contrary to the good of the individual you have to think about the two together if you don't you're in trouble um but the kinds of practical questions you have to answer and 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 i i give i give uh seven of them and um, and they, they're the kinds of questions that the law tries to answer as well. Um, is, you know, is, is the response proportionate to the problem? Is, it, does it produce minimal impairment? And that sort of thing that, that we're familiar with in, in, in legal uh, theory and legal practice. Um, and, and so a lot of the article is taken up with giving, you know, giving answers of several paragraphs to, to each of those questions and, um, and, and turning to ultimately to the, the, the deeper moral questions that are in play. Um, but, then, um, but then we can come to, to what you are suggesting is the deepest question. Do you want to just repeat that? Yeah, no, uh, yes. I do want to apologize that I, we had, uh, we hadn't really gotten through your actual arguments in the, in the article. Um, so yeah, maybe one day we'll spend more time, but yes, um, I should have said once these seven tests are, are passed, which I think is probably the first step would be a lot of meditation about, you know, what is the good. And, and if you really uh, believe that it's being violated, then what would be the most productive response to that as an individual? Right, right. Again, it with well, the common good in mind. Yeah, let me make the link here by way, as I do in the article, by way of the, se the seventh of those questions, uh, namely, do the, the policies in question serve their declared purpose, or do they serve some some other uh, uh, perhaps hidden agenda? Um, and I I suggest there that um, that they do serve not their declared purposes so much as uh, as other agendas, which are sometimes in some cases declared agendas by the the, the people that I was just referring to or people like them. And sometimes are hidden, are not stated at all. But if if one um, if one uh, decides, as I have decided in looking at this, that that fraud is being perpetrated, and that the whole exercise is serving an agenda which is as I say partly admitted and partly not admitted, but in any case is not the agenda that we are being told about by our authorities, by the government. The government is not saying we have to go through all this because we need a, 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 a passport society. We need a, a, you know, an electronically papered uh, society. We need surveillance. We need to be able to control people. They're not saying that. I, I, in looking at it, I have come to the, con, the conclusion that that's what's being done. And there are people who are helping it to be done, who are willing to say that that's what they're doing. But it's not what the government is telling the public. And so I, I have gone as far here as to say, yes, this is a form of fraud. It's a very serious fraud because it affects us on all levels. It affects our bodies. It affects our psyches. It affects our economies and it affects our political and legal economy. So all those different dimensions of the individual and common good, it touches on. Now, when you come to the conclusion uh, that something is, is awry, it doesn't have to be awry in that dramatic or serious or large a way, but, but I think it is. 
Um, but when you come to the conclusion that something is seriously awry and that it is, it is not furthering the common good, but indeed eroding and, and undermining it in a very serious fashion, then the point is that you're morally obligated to disobey. And your question is, okay, how? <laughs> um, and to what degree and in, in, in what fashion? Well, again, there you need casuistry and it will be different in different jurisdictions and perhaps different at different times in various jurisdictions. So um, uh, for me right now, uh, it in, uh, my own assessment is that, um, that knowing, knowing that masking is a very limited value against the virus, knowing that the virus cannot be eradicated and is not a great threat, uh, I will not mask uh, except in clinical settings uh, because uh, I think the mask has become a sign of subjection to the narrative and the narrative is destroying the common good, not supporting it. Um, but there are lots of other ways that one might be called upon to resist. Um, uh, and that, that may, you know, in, in a sense, Parks going to the front of the bus is a bit like refusing to wear a mask, <laughs> right? It's, it's a symbol, it's a symbol uh, a counter symbol to to an existing symbol, um, but but there are more serious forms of civil disobedience, such as unfolded in the civil rights movement in the '60s, and some of those, of course, landed people in jail, including Martin Luther King, who wrote, you know, one of the most famous, uh, uh, pract you know, practical mor moral documents of our time in his letter from the Birmingham jail. Um, and, and so as the situation escalates, so does the need for civil disobedience. In Austria right now, people, as you know, are protesting in their tens and hundreds of thousands against the, the, um, the coercive mandates, which are more draconian there than they are where I am. Um, and they are threatened with fines, crippling fines that will strip them of their property eventually, and even with, with jail. So in that kind of situation, I think myself that, that the civil disobedience is justified to the point of general strikes, uh, of, of demanding government uh, resignations, um, of refusing to pay taxes, um, in, in other words, the stakes are very, very high there. So you've got to risk more to, to, um, to rescue more. Um, the government cannot sustain itself if the populace in any large numbers refuses to, you know, it says, well, look, you, you've broken the social contract here and it's no longer operative. So we will not uh, do as you tell us. Uh, we will not go home at curfew. We will not uh, pay our taxes. We will not uh, um, uh, 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 obey your orders to be to be injected or to you know or to go to jail. Come and you know you know if you want to take me to jail, well, there's 20 people standing in front of me. You're going to have to take to jail first. And we're seeing some of that kind of thing in these countries where it's not a matter of the vaccinated against the unvaccinated, though there is unfortunately still that because that's been cultivated in the population through all kinds of intensive propaganda. Um, but we're seeing people who don't have the common ground of either having been inject, injected or not having been injected. Um, well, of course they have that common ground because they're one or the other, but the point is they're not dividing from one another on those grounds. They're standing together to say, wait a minute, you're taking away our freedoms and we won't have it. Now, the, the, the tougher the, the government and the stiffer the attempts to crush the, the, the populace, uh, the harder the civil disobedience demands get. We saw that before, of course. We saw it in 89, when, you know, when, when the Soviet empire fell. It took the kind of courage that the solidarity movement had in Poland and in and similar movements elsewhere to bring it down. 
And I, I think that's what's, what's required here too. Some governments may capitulate easier than others and it won't take the same level of sacrifice, but in some places like Austria and Australia, I, I think it's going to take a, a high level of sacrifice. And uh, do you think that there are instances where uh, the disobedi disobedience can be counterproductive? Like I've, I've seen arguments where, you know, if, if you're against masks, you refuse to wear one, you end up in jail and you lose your job. Now you're somehow incapacitated and you can't, uh, you know, you're sort of taken out of the game at that point and you can't win the bigger battle later on. Or is it really like, you know, you have to draw the line and, and take what take what will come. No, look, I mean, just as I spoke of casualty, I, I also have to speak of, of the virtue of prudence. So um, th there is, you know, take these two common sayings, you know, the, the, the New Hampshire slogan, live free or die, <laughs> right? And, and on the other hand, take the saying um, uh, uh, about uh, um, running away so as to live to fight another day, right? Um, those are, those are, or can be two sides of the same coin. Uh, that is, it's an, it's an all-out struggle. Either we have fundamental freedoms that the government recognizes as such, or we have no freedoms but what the government chooses to dispense to us. Those are, those are two fundamentally different approaches to governance and to being governed. Um, but when you're faced with the latter, and you're trying to resist it, the nature of the resistance has to be decided prudentially. In any war, you, you, you have to take judgments about the likelihood of success of a particular tactic, as well as whether the tactic itself is moral or immoral. If it's immoral on, on, on Catholic teaching, because it's never licit to do evil that good may come, you should dispense with it and find a tactic that is moral. But even if you find a tactic that is moral, you don't know whether to use it here or there or to this degree or that degree, except by the virtue of prudence and by exercising careful judgment. So um, I could say, well, look, um, uh, because I think the mask has become a symbol of our subjection, uh, I, will, I will never wear it. I know people who take that approach. I don't take it. I, I, think, I think that it's important to resist masking, among many other things. Taking away the, the, the human face, taking it away not just from other adults, but from children who need to see it. Um, and at the same time, putting in its place an electronic code that nobody can read but a computer. That's what's happening here. We're losing our faces, but getting in exchange a code that can be read by a computer. And those who control the computers can make use of it. So I think this is a fundamental battle. I don't think it's just a symbol. I, I, I think it's a quite fundamental battle. But that said, to fight that battle, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, well, look, you know, when I'm at the doctor's office or in the hospital or perhaps in a law court, that I will refuse ever to put a mask on because it may be more important that 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 I fight that battle in a different fashion in that context. There's nothing inherently evil about having a mask on, right? We are turning it into an evil and it has to be resisted, but it doesn't mean it has to be resisted everywhere and all the time. So, so it's a question of consistency, yes, but it's also a question of sound judgment about what's effective in a particular circumstance. Um, I, I, I try to walk that line. It's not an easy one to walk, but I think we need to try, and I do. Um, the same could be said of any other tactic. The, the, the tactic that is not morally acceptable should not be considered. That is to say, 
I'm not going to come up behind a policeman and club him in the head. Okay, he might come up behind me and club me in the head. I've seen videos like that from Australia. Um, and that's wrong. And you don't right a wrong by committing another wrong. So you don't come up behind the, the copper and hit him in the head before he can hit you. Um, but if the people need to defend themselves against the government, uh, there are options available which we would not normally use because there are exceptional times when you have to use exceptional methods. I don't think they should ever be morally exceptional. There is no, there is no such thing. It's either moral or it's immoral, but it can be morally applied in this circumstance and not morally applied in another circumstance. So if you're in a just war and you have recognized combatants facing each other, a certain amount of clubbing is going to go on. Um, but if you're sneaking up behind somebody and clubbing them when, <laughs> you know, uh, just, just to get rid of them because you don't like their position, you don't like what they're doing, well, that's not moral and it's not morally acceptable. So I'm not calling for violent civil disobedience, but I am calling for effective civil disobedience and that may include uh, high risk activities where, where there is a possibility of jail, there is a possibility of loss of income, and there is a possibility of, of, of physical force having to be used in certain justified circumstances. But I'm not calling for mobs and I am not calling for um, uh, people to ransack uh, uh, government buildings or any such thing. I, I think one of the things that the civil rights movement of the 60s showed and that, that Gandhi's movement showed and so forth is that nonviolent civil disobedience can be very effective and is an important tool in, in any uh, war of this magnitude. So I'm, I'm asking people to begin thinking about that because I think there is a war against them of great magnitude by very serious and very wealthy people who want to fundamentally uh, change the systems in which we live and to deprive us of liberties that were not given to us by man, but by God. Have you seen a, a movie called A Hidden Life by Terrence Malick? I have heard of it, but I have not seen it yet, no. Highly recommended, very good movie uh, about a, a Austrian farmer who refused to swear an oath to Hitler and uh, faced great risks. Uh, but anyway, very nicely done movie. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm uh, going to wrap it up. Unfortunately, it was a very great discussion. And But if you had any uh, final uh, thoughts, uh, Professor, uh, please uh, feel free. I, I know you have a, a website that you're working on. So if, if you have anything that people can, can look into, uh, let us know. Well, on the academic side, some colleagues and I have have produced a, a, a site that they can people can find at rsqar.net um, to encourage academics to think harder about these things. That's rsqar.net. Um, but I, I think I want in conclusion to, to come back to the conclusion of my article, which, which is, is the, the, um, the point and to the point uh, made in that conclusion uh, that, that tyranny arises when, people have lost the sense of the virtuous life, the good life, the moral life. That's when they become susceptible to tyranny. Um, and, and so my message is not, is not just one of, well, look, stand up, be, you know, you know, be, be brave. Um, you know, I'm no braver than the next person. I, it, it isn't, it isn't simply a call to, you know, to fight, stand and fight. It is, it is that. And I, I think that's essential, but, but it's also a call to, to repentance. It's a call to rediscover 
the virtuous life and to be able to help build a more virtuous society, which is not susceptible to lies and fraud and tyranny. So um, the conclusion to my article, you know, goes to those quite pressing, not only moral, but spiritual considerations, which, which I do not think detached from our political and economic and medical situation. Um, the human being is designed uh, to be a unity of body and soul. And unless we can put those bodily goods in perspective uh, of the goods of the soul, uh, we, we are not going to achieve the balance that we need to live happily and healthily uh, within a society that truly um, serves the common good and that also uh, uh, respects the, the dignity and freedom of the, of the individual human person. Uh, so, so it is, it is um, the article is intended not just to um, lay out uh, the logic of, of the struggle and not just to call people to not only think but act, uh, it's it's also intended to call them to consider the motives of their actions and and the need for uh, a reform not only of society but of the person, so that um, so that we can um, liberate ourselves from false narratives and defend ourselves against those who would would take away our the the goods that the Creator intends for us. Thank you very much, Professor. We, we can't thank you enough for your time. That was another great one. Well, happy to give it and happy to see you both again and, and, uh, and uh, wishing you much success in your own pondering and wrestling with these things and, uh, and your, your viewers as well. Thank you so much. And we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And yes, to thank you. you. Happy holidays. Happy uh, Christmas, happy new year. Um, even, even though the, the new year we celebrate is not on the Christian calendar, but the pagan one, um, I wish you all the best. <laughs>